Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.
hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God, we come into this place with nothing but humility. We know that we are nothing without you, Lord God. And we are here to give you all of the praise and the honor and the glory for you are holy.
Hallelujah. 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 I want to invite our pastors to come forward that help us pray for people. If you come on forward, pastors. If you're here today and you need a healing in your body, would you just slip out of your seat? Come on forward for prayer. If you have a family member that's sick and needs a healing, come on forward and stand in for them for prayer. Hallelujah. If you have any other kind of need, uh, you just want someone to agree with you in prayer, just come on forward and, and these pastors will agree with you and pray with you. You can go ahead and begin praying for people. You know, when you come forward in these services, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of, I just want somebody to agree with me in prayer. Can y'all say amen? I just need, it's a prayer of agreement. Sometimes you can be praying for something for a long time, but just a prayer of agreement will just break through for us. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, God, that you're here in a powerful and a wonderful way. Lord, we thank you for healing today in the name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, today that you, Lord, will just heal. You'll just touch people, Lord, in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Right now. Praise team, I want you to go on down and begin to pray for people too. We need more people to pray. Come on, praise team. Hallelujah. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we lose your healing today. Come on, the presence of God is here to heal. The presence of God is here to touch people. And Lord, we pray for these today, Lord, that your hand will be upon them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, sing that chorus again, will you? Go ahead. Praise Him. Hallelujah. I exalt. God's doing something great this morning. Hallelujah. I exalt. Come on, keep praising Him this morning. God's giving us a breakthrough. Come on. Every day is a gift. Today is a gift from you. I choose to serve you all of my days. I thank you for healing my body. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for working in my family. All my family will be saved. In Jesus' name, miracles are coming my way. I believe in miracles. Come on, say it again. I believe in miracles. God's anointing is upon my life. And God has given me breakthroughs. In 
Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this congregation today. I thank you for every person that's here in this building. And I thank you, God, for the power of God to save and to deliver and to heal, to bless your people. And I thank you, God, that you are bringing great breakthroughs and great miracles to your people, Lord. And I thank you, God, Lord, for your faithfulness and your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your kindness, God. Lord, we exalt you today. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Come on, lift that hand to the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Lord, I'm going to praise you when I feel like it. I'm going to praise you when I don't feel like it. Because you're still God and you're still on the throne. And you have a great plan for me and my family. And I thank you, God, for your touch upon my life. In Jesus' name. Now stretch your hands towards our city. Lord, we pray for the city of Louisville. We pray, oh God, for Mayor Fisher, the leaders of our city, that you'll help them, direct them, bless them in the name of the Lord. I pray for every police officer today. It's your protection and blessing and favor and good judgments upon their life. I pray for every EMS worker. I pray, oh God, today, God, for every firefighter. I pray, oh God, for our schools. I pray for our colleges, Lord. God, that you'll give us a move of God in our city, Lord, in every area, Lord. In the name of the Lord, I thank you, God, for churches that preach the word of God, that won't back down and will preach the true word of God. And we thank you for peace in our city. In the name of the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for President Trump. We pray for those that are in leadership. God, I pray for the protection of God upon our senators and Congress, men and women, God, that you'll protect them and bless them. Help them, God, to make good decisions, God. Help them to get something done in the name of the Lord. God, that's good for our nation, God. Lord, in Jesus' name, you told us to pray for those that are in authority, and that's what we do today, Lord. And, Lord, I pray for our Supreme Court justices. I pray, oh, God, for the decisions that are pending. I pray, oh, God, you'll help our nation. Lord, we humble ourselves today, and we ask that God would visit our nation again. Lord, send a move of God, we pray. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Now lay your hand on your heart. Pray with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins. We forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, just lift the hand of the Lord for another minute right now. Let the Lord just speak to you right now. Just say, Lord, speak to me. Hallelujah. Lord, I open up my heart. I open up my heart today, God, for what you have for me. Lord, I thank you, God, that I have the privilege to serve you. Lord, I open up to all that, that you have for me today and my family. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, that you're a great God. I thank you that you're bringing healing to our church, healing to our, our families, healing to our lives. In the name of the Lord, hallelujah. Let's pray for Pastor Bob and Pastor Margaret. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Bob and Pastor Margaret and their family. God, we thank you for continually bringing the healing, God, that's coming their way. We thank you, God. We continue to pray, Lord. Uphold them, Lord, that you give them wisdom and strength and power in the name of Jesus and direction in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for them today. Lord, I pray for Governor Bevan today. I pray, oh God, that you'll give him wisdom. Help the state of Kentucky move ahead. Lord, in righteousness, God, we pray. Lord, give our governor wisdom and strength and good decisions, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. And everybody said amen. amen. Give the Lord a great hand today, would you? <laughs> hallelujah. Tell you what, how many of you felt just the presence of God in that, in that time of worship and praise today? Hallelujah. Thank God. You may be seated. The ushers are going to go ahead and pass out our communion at this time. God bless you. How many of you appreciate this great praise team and these wonderful musicians? Give them a wonderful hand, too. Thank you. Good morning. God is so good. I'm going to read to you a little bit this morning. Is that all right? It says this. And many of us have heard this before in Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. 
There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Then he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that it, you will come to life. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. So I prophesy and I said, as I had been commanded, while I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together. Bone to bone, as I looked, tendons appeared on them, flesh grew, and skin covering them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says, breath. Come from the four winds and breath into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he had commanded, the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet in a vast army. Lord, I thank you, and I pray that your breath will flow on us this morning, Lord, that it will come into us, Lord, and you will use us as that vast army of God in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to remind you, that the finished work of God was done at the cross. Every need was met there. The healing was done there. Salvation was done there. And Lord, I pray that today as we eat the bread of life, that your breath is loosed into us, that life is loosed into us in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us eat together. And let us drink together. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would, if you have your Bible, whether it's the printed page or the electronic device, whatever it might be, if you would, just take it and hold it up to the Lord, and let's make this confession together. Say, this is the Word of God. I believe it's true. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do, and I can have what it says I can have. The promises of God's Word are for me. And I receive them today by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. And we thank you that the word of God is life and strength to us. And Lord, I pray by the Holy Spirit that you would lead us in these next few moments, that your will would be done and that you would manifest by the Holy Spirit your purpose and plan in each and every one of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24. I'm actually going to have you follow me in the Scriptures to three passages. This will be the first and then two in the book of Acts. And I want to talk to you today for a few moments about the three P's of Pentecost. Evangel World Prayer Center is a Pentecostal church. We're a non-denominational church. We have our roots deep in a traditional Pentecostal movement. But it would be safe to say that we are Pentecostal or charismatic. While there may be those that would argue a distinction between those two titles, we would not. Uh, we believe it has to do with the gifting of the Holy Spirit, and it has to do with the book of Acts experience of Acts chapter 2. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But we are a church that believes in that fullness of the Holy Spirit, that God can move today in the now, and the Holy Spirit is present with us to do that very work. And so if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 24, beginning in the 44th verse. And I want you to see the sequence. Some of this is the very words of Jesus, and some of it will be 
the Holy Scriptures that we read, of course, that is God's Word as well. Luke 24, 44, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and prophets in the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising God. Amen. Now go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 1. And in case you were not aware of this, the book of Acts was also written by Luke. The Luke-Acts record of the gospel carries from the ministry of Jesus into the ministry of the early church. And there's a continuity of the message. And in fact, there's passages in which Luke identifies himself when he says, we were there, or we witnessed these things. And so here in the beginning of Acts, you really have almost a carryover of what we just read in the book of Luke. So begin at verse 4 and follow along. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. I want everyone to say, promise of the Father. Which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria into the end of the earth. And then to chapter 2. After they did what Jesus had instructed them to do, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is such an incredible passage of Scripture, and it lays out for us some of what Jesus had to say concerning the Holy Spirit, or the promise of the Father being given. It also indicates for us that this was God's plan from the beginning. This isn't something that was just thought up. This wasn't just a fringe group that came together and had an experience. No, this was God's perfect plan and how God designed things to be. Now, I want to lay just a little bit of a foundation and share with you that the Pentecostal or charismatic person sees the baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit as an experience that is subsequent to conversion or salvation. In other words, there is something that happens in the infilling of the Holy Spirit that is separate from being born again. Now, having said that, I've seen it happen almost instantaneously. I've seen when someone come up in an altar call and give their heart to Christ, and in just a matter of minutes or even seconds, they begin to speak with other tongues. Yet that is two experiences that God brought together quickly. On the other hand, I've known people that have been born again, and it was a long period of time. I don't necessarily think that's God's plan for them to wait a long period of time, but 
Some things happen, and sometimes people uh, really don't get the faith to believe for that infilling of the Holy Spirit until much later in life. And so it's an opportunity, though, for someone to receive what God has in store for them. If I were to do a survey here this morning, I have a feeling that the vast majority of you would say, I want everything God has for me. If you really feel like that, then this baptism in the Holy Spirit is just that. And those of you that are already baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I know there must be many here as well, you understand what I'm talking about. Now, it should be understood that when we say baptism in the Holy Spirit, we're not just talking about, again, that conversion experience, but that separate happening that takes place when the Holy Spirit that brings us to new life overflows within. I once heard it described like this. It's kind of like filling up a bottle with water. And let's say the water represents the Holy Spirit. But when that, water, that bottle full of water, as full as it can be, is submerged into the Ohio River, then it is thoroughly baptized in that water or in the Holy Spirit. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is a part of our yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit so that we can receive all that He has for us. Now, we believe that a part of that baptism, the initial evidence of it, is speaking with other tongues. I'll tell you a little more in a moment about how wonderful it is that God would give us that heavenly language to be able to speak with other tongues. But I want to say right now that speaking with other tongues does not require that we be passive in our mind concerning our experience with God and with the Holy Spirit or that we go into some hypnotic state or trance. I know most of you understand that, but there may be those who are hearing the message today that need to understand that we are fully in our right mind when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues, but we have chosen to yield ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. In other words, when a person begins to speak with other tongues, as it says here, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit began to speak with other tongues through them, as the Spirit gave utterance, nowhere in the Scripture does it say that the Holy Spirit just comes in and takes over a person and they have no choice in the matter as to whether or not they speak with other tongues. No, it's a step of faith, yielding to the Holy Spirit to take those words, those utterances that the Holy Spirit gives us and to then choose to begin to speak them out. Now, a lot of times when we do that, we have an experience. We'll have a feeling. We'll have a sensation. However, you don't have to. It can be simply a step of faith where you are doing so according to the Word of God, receiving what God has instructed. But I'm so glad that we can feel God. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit is one of the avenues by which we can feel the presence of God. Now, talking about Pentecost. When you talk about being Pentecostal, there are some stereotypes that people have concerning Pentecostal people. Uh, you might have even come in here today with a certain stereotype of what it is to be Pentecostal or charismatic. But unfortunately, what's happened is what people begin to use to identify someone as Pentecostal or charismatic are the responses of the human flesh to the touch of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. Now listen, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out, some things happened. There were some suddenlies that took place. There was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. There were cloven tongues as of fire. And all of a sudden, this group began to speak in languages they had never learned before. And people outside of the upper room heard the commotion. And they heard the people speaking. And they heard them speaking in even their languages, though they had never learned the language. People heard the witness of God because the Holy Spirit was communicating through them. You say, oh, that was just in Bible days. No, it's not. We've had experiences right in our church, whether here or at Miner's Lane, where someone was praying in the altar and someone had come from a foreign land and they heard the witness of the gospel and the praising of the Lord through that individual that had never learned their language. But they heard it clearly as they came into that atmosphere. 
story. There's books written that tell stories of where someone has gone. Perry Stone was here last week. He told a story of a people that he knew that would go in and actually were able to communicate. Even though they never learned the German language, they spoke clearly to someone, a, a witness, a last opportunity witness of the gospel. Powerful things that can and do happen in Pentecost. But what I want you to understand is Pentecost is not just the shout, though he's in the shout. It's not just the dance, though he's in the dance. It's not just the tears that flow or the praises that go up, though he's in those things. He's not just in the jerk and all the kind of things that can happen whenever you're touched by the Spirit of God. But those are good things. Those are physical responses to the Holy Spirit. And when Almighty God, through the Holy Spirit, begins to touch this human flesh, sometimes you just can't predict what you're going to do. But the unfortunate part of that is that some people then have tagged that as what Pentecost is. This morning, I want to share with you a message so that we come to understand better what Pentecost is. Now, I don't stand up here to tell you I am the authority on Pentecost. No, I don't. I will share with you this has been my whole life. This is what I've been around my whole life. This is what I've studied. This is what I've been a part of. So while I do not think that I know everything, there's a few things that I can share with you this morning that I hope you will, will help us all to understand what it is to be Pentecostal. Because what I've discovered is a lot of people are just simply afraid of it. They love the enthusiasm. They love the excitement of worship. They love the good things, but they're just simply afraid of it themselves, especially this matter of speaking with other tongues. But I've come to tell you there is nothing to be afraid of. Let me share with you these three P's of Pentecost. And then I believe God's going to touch us in a wonderful way. First of all, the Holy Spirit is person. The Holy Spirit is person. Sometimes because of the word spirit, people want to identify the Holy Spirit as a force, as a cloud, as the wind. And as I've already mentioned, he's in those things, but he is a person. When you read through the record of Scripture, you find that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When you look at the record of Scripture, the predominant member of the Trinity that you see in the Old Testament is the Father, simply referred to as God or Lord, Jehovah. Although there are times when the Holy Spirit comes upon someone and they're anointed for a particular task. Uh, Gideon's a great example. David's a great example. And of course, Samson is another. But there are times when the Spirit would come upon. But in the New Testament, what we're talking about in Pentecost is when the Spirit indwells and overflows within us. In fact, Jesus said, Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of concerning the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is person. There's numerous attributes that are given to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In John 14, 26, He's our helper, our comforter, or our advocate. He's also known as the Spirit of truth. We know that He can be grieved. He has will. He has knowledge, searches things. He's a teacher, comforter, etc. All these things are said of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. In the Gospels, you see the record of the ministry of Jesus. He comes in the incarnate flesh, but Jesus talks about the promise of the Father. He talks about the Holy Spirit that will come. He ascends. In fact, at one point he says, it is to your advantage that I go away so that I might send the Holy Spirit. So while there's not a box that you can put God in, you see these parameters that God lays out through the Scripture. But when you come to the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes and is poured out, the infilling happens, it ignites the church. Something dramatic happens. People that had cowered away because of fear, concerned about what would happen, what happened to Jesus, will it happen to us? 
all these kinds of experiences that they had, even Peter denying Christ, is transformed because of the person of the Holy Spirit. I say that because in Romans 8, 26, uh, the King James Version, which is a great Bible, has a misrepresentation in the interpretation of a word. And it says the Spirit itself. But actually, the correct interpretation is the Spirit Himself. And so we want to make clear, because we give honor to the Holy Spirit. You say, well, well wait a minute now. You're supposed to only exalt Jesus. I agree with you. I agree with you, but when you flow with the Holy Spirit, you will only be exalting Jesus. And there's nothing wrong than having, with having relationship with the Holy Spirit, who is the agent of God in the earth today, leading and guiding the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said this. He said, Thy kingdom come, pray this way, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Way, the way we're going to see the kingdom of God come and the will of God done is when we come into cooperation with the person of the Holy Spirit because he's been given the assignment to lead the church in this day and time. And so we want to flow with the Holy Spirit and recognize. So never refer to the Holy Spirit as it. Never refer to the Holy Spirit as a force. Yes, he has power, but he is person. Get to know the Holy Spirit. Welcome the Holy Spirit in your life. The Bible says, Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within. Become familiar with the Holy Spirit and the ways of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And the Holy Spirit is not going to force himself into your life. But if you will welcome him, if you will open your heart, and allow the Holy Spirit, He will lead you, He will guide you, He will speak to you, He'll deposit the gifts of the Spirit within you, He'll pour out wisdom, He'll enable you to have direction in your life, He'll warn you of things to come. The Holy Spirit is very precious, and He is welcome here today. Amen? Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. The second P is... It's personal for you and for me. Pentecost is not an organization. Pentecost is not a denomination. Pentecost is not even a single church. Pentecost is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. Sometimes people are afraid of the Holy Spirit because they think, uh-oh, if I allow something to happen like that in my life, I'm liable to do something that will embarrass me. Okay, let me help you with that. Number one, I guarantee you, if the Holy Spirit does anything in your life, you're not going to be embarrassed. You say, oh, wait a minute, Brother Kevin. What if I get up there and jerk and shout and dance about? I promise you, if you have that experience and that's something contrary to who you are, I guarantee you, you're going to be glad you did if it was the Holy Spirit. Now, having said that, because I, again, I'm not going to put the Holy Spirit in a box, and I can't say that sometimes there aren't some real supernatural, spectacular things that could happen. By and large, though, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, according to Acts 1.8, is to endue us with power. That word for power there is dunamis. And we get words like dynamite, like dynamo, or dynamic from that same root word. And what it tells us is the Holy Spirit wants to take us and make us to be the fullness of the potential that God created within us. You see, God knows us. Scripture tells us we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're knit together in our mother's womb. God understands who we are. He understands our DNA because He created it. He designed us. You know, a lot of times people think, oh, I wish I could be like that one or the other one and so forth. Listen, every single person here has a unique design, and it did not surprise God. What he wants to do, though, 
is to help you overcome the effects of sin and the degeneration that has come into humanity that will often pervert that design, will cause feelings of inferiority, uh, rough edges, all kinds of things about us that God wants to perfect. And he does that by the Holy Spirit. So what the Holy Spirit wants to do is work in us as a person. And it's a personal experience we have with him where he refines us and he causes us to reach our full potential in Christ. The Holy Spirit's very special. And the Holy Spirit wants to work in each individual. Don't come, don't come here to evangel and miss the opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to make you to be who God wants you to be. When we read in the Word, and in fact, as we said earlier in that confession, that we want to be who God wants us to be, we want to receive what God has for us. Listen, it happens by the Holy Spirit, that personal experience we have with Him. And one of the ways that God works in us is through that prayer language. Praying in the Holy Ghost, where we can speak with other tongues. I don't want to just go through a litany of all the evidences of Scripture, but quickly let me hit a couple of points, and then we'll wrap this up. In the Bible, there's five references to speaking with other tongues in the book of Acts. Three of those five times, they spoke with other tongues. It's clearly stated in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. In Acts, Acts <laughs> chapters... 8 and 9, there's also references to supernatural happenings that most likely were speaking with other tongues. One of them was the Apostle Paul receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say there that he spoke in tongues, but we know from 1 Corinthians, he spoke in tongues more than you all. He very clearly t talks about that. In Acts chapter 8, they wanted to buy what the apostles had whenever Simon the sorcerer was touched and whenever the girl lost the powers to do that sorcery. So God moved in that situation, and it's very likely that they spoke with other tongues. As I mentioned, Paul defends it. 1 Corinthians 14, three times, I would that you speak in tongues. I would that you all speak with other tongues. I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. Forbid not that you speak with other tongues. All these are New Testament references. Well, why is it important to speak with other tongues because by and large the Christian world will tell you it's a choice it doesn't matter you can just take it or leave it now let me say clearly you do not have to have that to go to heaven because we're saved by faith through grace but why would anyone want to live this life without the infilling of the Holy Spirit why would you want to live life without being able to pray in that heavenly prayer language? Because in Jude 20 it says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. It even says in verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, snatching others from the flames of hell's fire. So there's an intercession, there's a power. You see, a lot of people struggle in their walk with the Lord. They struggle to live the Christian life. Well, what you need is the power of the Holy Ghost. Whenever you have the power of the Holy Ghost in your life, you can walk right, talk right, live right, pray right. All those kind of things begin to manifest when you allow the Holy Spirit's work in you. When you don't know how to pray as you ought, we alluded to this earlier, you pray in the Holy Ghost. And when you do, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, you're praying the perfect will of God. You're communicating with heaven in the language that God has given to you. It's a powerful thing to be able to pray in the Holy Ghost. It's what makes this so personal for each one of us. It's how we can have the wisdom of God. And furthermore, it opens to us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I want to go back to Jesus' prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, one of the ways that the Holy Spirit is active in seeing the kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven is through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit that allow us to know what heaven knows, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and allows us to do what heaven does, gift of faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings, all those kinds of things happen as the Holy Spirit is fulfilling the plan 
that Jesus set in order in his church. Thirdly, it's not just that he's a person or that it's personal for you and me, but it's also to be public. It's to be public. Acts 1.8 again, you're to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. What does the fullness of the Spirit do in our life? Well, one of the first things is you give us a boldness. Now, boldness comes in many flavors. Boldness doesn't look the same on every individual, but boldness is boldness. It's having that confidence in the Holy Spirit to be able to share the love of God with people that desperately need it. To pray when prayer is needed. To touch people to the glory of God. That's what they did when they went up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Peter and John go up there. This is days after Pentecost. Maybe weeks after Pentecost. And they go and they see the lame man. Maybe they've seen him before. It's very likely. But today they see him with the eyes of the Holy Spirit. And they go up and say to him, Silver and gold have we none. But such as we have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And they took him by the hand. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. What was that? That was boldness that comes by the Holy Spirit. When they were on trial before leaders and those that had authority, those that had beaten them and put them in stocks and bonds, what did they, what did they do? They spoke boldly the word of God. And they declared the truth. They had the remembrance of Scripture. Jesus had said, you won't have to worry about what to say because the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what you need in that moment, in that hour. The Holy Spirit allows us to have a public witness, to be an irrestrainable witness in the world today. It's the power for service. If we want to see this city changed, if we want to see our state or this nation changed, then we've got to be the church of the book of Acts. We've got to be the people of the Holy Spirit, lifting up Christ, carrying the cross, letting people know there is an answer to their need. Everyone has to answer this question. Acts chapter 19 and verse 2. Have you received since you believed? If you ever wondered, is it separate from salvation? That gives you clear evidence. But here's the question. Somebody said, well, do I really have to have the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues? I alluded to this earlier, but I want to say it clearly. That's the wrong question. The right question is, why wouldn't you want to? And there is no reason. You might come up with an excuse, but there is no reason why you wouldn't want that. There are those that struggle. And this is, how I think, why the Holy Spirit led me this way today. I really believe this is as much for people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit before or people that have been trying to live for God but have struggled because... If you're trying to do this on your own in the world in which we're living now, you are wearing yourself out. You can't be good enough. You, you can't do everything that needs to be done as a Christian unless you lean on the Holy Spirit. Unless you allow the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to encourage you, to help you. You know, it's good to pray in tongues every day. And just allow yourself to be built up in the Spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost. But we also need to hear the Holy Spirit. We need to know when to go and when to stop. I would, I'm not going to do a survey, but I would guess that many people here have had the Holy Spirit prompt you to talk to someone, to not go that direction, only to discover there was a terrible accident that happened. I've heard those testimonies many times. We need the Holy Spirit in our life. Parents need the Holy Spirit to raise their children. We need the Holy Spirit in our finances. We need the Holy Spirit in all that we do. And you know, it's like the Holy Spirit's just waiting. Waiting. You'll see us struggle. Trying to make it in life. Trying to figure it out for ourselves. Trying to do it on our own. And he's just sitting there saying, come on, invite me in, welcome me, let me be a part of this. I want to help you. And I believe that's the word of the Lord to some people here today. You're very open to this. It's not as though you're fighting it. 
but, but you've gotten into an apathetic place where you're just going at your own ability. And I want to say this. We live in a dangerous time. Amen. And here's the danger. We live in an age of internet technologies, all the technological advances, all the great things that we can do for ourselves, the growth of knowledge. It's growing exponentially. And all these things will tempt us to try to live by the arm of the flesh rather than by the arm of the Spirit. And today's message is just to call us back. Let's be people of the Spirit. Let's walk in the Holy Spirit. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to do in our lives. It's the greatest way of living. I could tell you many, many stories, just almost blow your mind stories of how God can lead you, how God can direct you. I'm going to close with just one. This is, this is one of those mind-blowing stories, and it's from my dad's life and from mine when I was a kid. I was brought up in church, never missed church. Every time the doors are open, that kind of stuff, you hear about it. That was how I was brought up. Now, my dad went and moved the tables and chairs, cleaned the floors, set it up, cleaned it up, shut, shut it down. So it was a very unusual thing when one Wednesday night, which was the midweek service, he said to my mom, now Chris, you just take the kids and you go on to church. The Holy Spirit told me not to go tonight. <laughs> she said, What? The Holy Spirit told you not to go to church tonight? You got to be kidding me. Now, I don't want a bunch of you using this. <laughs> Unless it really is the Holy Spirit. She, he said, yes, it's the Holy Spirit, and I know it, and I am not to go to church. So, Mom put us in the car, and off to church we go. After church, we hear this story. Dad, while they're at home... The phone rang. Now, this was when you didn't have cell phones, answering machines. In other words, if he wasn't there, the phone wouldn't have been answered. So the phone rings, he answers the phone, and it's the neighbor across the street. And he says, Charlie, I need to talk to you. He said, I think I'm just going to end it all. And so my dad goes over next door, and he walks in the house, and here's our neighbor sitting in his easy chair with his pistol right here on the table beside him. He said, I just can't take it anymore. Well, long story short, Dad ministered to him, led him to the Lord, saved his life. How? By the Holy Spirit. You say, oh, does he do those kind of things? Yes, even today. Even today, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and lead you and guide you. Could we all stand together? I want to invite everyone to come down around the altar. We'll dismiss here in just a moment, but I believe the Holy Spirit wants to just stir some things up in us. Maybe there needs to be a little bit of personal revival in our lives and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us today. I want you to join me if you would and come. And let's just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Let's not be bashful about it. Whenever the Spirit of God dwells within us, we don't have to be hesitant or wait. We can begin to pray in the Spirit just as readily as we need to. So let's just begin to do that right now. If you've never received the infilling of the Holy Spirit speaking with other tongues, would you just lift your hand where you are and wave it at me? You'd like to receive it, but you never have. Just hold your hand up. Just hold it up there. If you see someone near you with their hand lifted in this way, would you just 
begin to pray with them. Just lay your hand on their shoulder. To all of you, I would say, do not overthink it. Don't try to figure it out right now. You can look in the scriptures and come to better understanding. But right now, by faith, receive in the name of Jesus. And right now, let's just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And you can begin to pray in that prayer language right now. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now I want to pray specifically for a group of people. And this is who the Holy Spirit's really been dealing with me about. You're here, and, and you've been going through the motions. And that may be the way some of you have even described it. You just say, I'm just going through the motions. I don't really feel anything. Well, I want to say we walk by faith and not by sight. So you just keep doing what the Word says. But I'm also glad to tell you, you can feel God. And God will give you a breakthrough. And you'll be able to sense the presence of the Lord. But if you're in one of those low places and you need God just to pull you out, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now by the Holy Ghost that you'll come and that you will lift them up. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just lift those hands high. Hallelujah. Receive now by faith. In the